So I'm going to talk to you today about what we have learned from the Google Season of Docs program. So um, my name is Erin McKean, and I am a developer relations engineer, and I work on contributor experience and docs advocacy in Google's open source programs office. So my job, and it is a fun one, is to help open source projects have better docs. Um, if you need other credentials, I'm also an honorary fellow of the Society for Technical Communication, and I run the online nonprofit English language dictionary WordNIC, and I also run the Semicolon Appreciation Society. So I have stickers for the Semicolon Appreciation Society up here if you want one. Um, so anyway, that's me. What is a Google Season of Docs? So. Season of Docs was originally created by two Googlers, Sarah Maddox and Andrew Chen. Some of you may know Sarah Maddox and Andrew from their work in Kubernetes and other open source projects. It's been a program that's had two phases. For the first couple of years, it was a technical writing mentorship program, and now it is a grant program. You may have noticed that the name Season of Docs is very close to Summer of Code. So the original idea was, what if Summer of Code, but Docs? But over time, the two programs have diverged in format and intent. So before I go any further, how many Season of Docs and Summer of Code alumni do we have in this room? Raise your hand if you participate in the program. Yay, thank you so much. I'm glad you're here. Get some stickers um, <laughs> after the duck. So here are some highlights of the main differences between the two programs. So Summer of Code is a mentorship program. It's intended to get people into open source communities, teach them the customs and the norms of open source communities, how to contribute to build those communities, give students and now beginners, not just students anymore, um, experience in open source. And it's been going on for 20 years. It's a really big program. It's a very big program. Um, hundreds of people participate. Season of Docs is a grant program we give money directly to the open source projects. The goals are, first of all, to create documentation in these projects, but then also to create knowledge of best practices in open source documentation to help others. It's been going on for about six years and it is a very small program. Um, so uh, this year we're, we have 11 organizations participating. And so, I think that everybody who's been coming to, to talks in this particular track knows that docs are important. And in fact, you probably already saw this stat in Lana's talk earlier about how 72% um, of developers say that established policies and documentation is key. That's a key thing that developers look for when they're choosing open source. And that lack of documentation was the top reason developers gave for deciding against using an open source project. I know that that is something that I take into account when I'm trying to figure out what I'm gonna use. Um, this is some relatively newer research from the DORA program. And this is uh, focused most more on proprietary projects, but that new hires on teams with well-written documentation and then there's some mathy talk here, are 130% as productive as new hires on teams with poorly written documentation. And I think that we could, in good faith, extrapolate this to open source as well, if you think new contributor instead of new hire. And um, that the state of the Octoverse report in 2021 showed that both in open source and enterprises, developers see a productivity boost about 50% if there's documentation that's easy to source. And I think by easy to source, they mean easy to find. Um, so survey after survey shows that developers care about docs. They make choices based on docs. If your code is awesome, but you have no docs, you're actually falling behind in adoption programs that may be more technically adept, but have uh, less technically adept, but have better docs. Um, so how does season of docs work? We're taking this research and we're saying, okay, we would like to have a program that helps open source have better docs. So how does this program work? So here's the process for organizations that want to participate in Season of Docs. First of all, you should have a problem. This is a very easy step. Most organizations can accomplish this step without much trouble. And then you think, what docs might help solve this problem? And then you think, okay, well, how are we gonna measure the success of this documentation? How are we gonna know if it worked? Then 
you take the grant money that you get from participating in the program and you pay a dedicated technical writer to write the docs. We encourage projects to hire technical writers who have experience. Some projects also like to hire people who are uh, new to technical writing, um, but who know more of their domain. That's totally up to the project. And then the project should write a case study to share what they learned. So I wanna point out that you can be a project participating in Season of Docs, and you can absolutely create no documentation. You could flame out, you could have every sort of obstacle come in your way, but if you write a case study that is honest about what you tried and what you learned and what advice you would give to other projects, we consider that a successful participation in, open, in Season of Docs. We don't require that you create perfect, wonderful, amazing documentation. We would like you to, we think that would be great. What the requirement of the program is now is that you write an honest and uh, thorough case study about what you tried, what you learned, what happened because that's the only way that other people will be able to learn from your experience. And I don't know about you, but I think everybody learns better from mistakes, but I prefer to learn from other people's mistakes when at all possible. So we've seen 73 case studies since 2021. And again, I said 11 more orgs uh, are participating this year. So that's 11 more case studies, hopefully, that will show up towards the end of this year. And then what's in that case study? So basically we want projects to put into the case study the information that we thought other projects would find useful when they're exploring how to create better documentation. So project description, what were you trying to do? Budget, how much did you think it was going to cost? And then how much did it actually cost? Who are the participants? Who's participating as the organization admin? Who in the project is going to answer questions from the technical writer? Who in the project is gonna onboard the technical writer into whatever apparatus you use to run the project? Who's gonna invite them to the GitHub org, right? Who's gonna make them join Slack or Discourse or IRC or whatever you're using to communicate? What's the timeline? When did you start? What were your milestones? When did you finish? What were your results? What documentation did you produce? What documentation did you plan but not produce? What metrics did you choose? Uh, what metrics did you end up actually being able to measure? Any, an, any analysis, like what retrospection did you do about your project? What would you have done differently? What were you pleasantly surprised by? A summary, the TLDR of the case study, and then an appendix with anything else that you want to include. Like um, some people have included like uh, links to all their documentation that they did produce, um, uh, other, just basically other information that they think would be helpful, not to, not to us as the program organizers, but to other open source projects that want to learn how can we solve our problems with docs. So when you look at the case studies, you can see that people aren't really writing documentation to write documentation. They're writing documentation for people. That's because I think, as we all know, most project problems are people problems. And documentation doesn't just help the people that you already have in your community. Documentation helps bring people to your community and keep people in your community. A user who can't use your project isn't actually a user. A contributor who can't contribute isn't actually a contributor. And a maintainer who can't maintain, you know, because of overwhelm or not knowing what to do next, might not continue as a maintainer. So even though most of the case studies that we've seen have focused a lot on what types of documentation they've created, the goals of their projects were all either implicitly or explicitly people goals. So um, <laughs> a quick aside into types of documentation, you've heard this discussed before, a lot of projects use this diataxis framework to discuss the types of documentation that they created or wanted to create. And this concept comes from um, Daniela Pachita, who outlined these four types in his 2017 PyCon Australia talk. So um, this is just a really helpful framework. Sometimes people's docs don't fall into this framework and that's fine. You know, there's many different kinds of docs as there are problems. But here's how the metrics that people mentioned in their case studies map to the doc types that people and projects wanted to create. They usually wanted more people, right? They wanted more users, more contributors, and they wanted less noise, fewer questions, fewer issues. So tutorials, you want more visits, more people giving your project a try, 
um, fewer questions, right? How-to guides, more people satisfied with using your project. They know how to do the thing they wanna do. Fewer questions. Explanation, more people qualified to use or contribute to your project. Fewer questions. Reference, make more of your project made more intelligible to more people. Fewer questions. Each of these types of documentation results in fewer questions to maintainers from, is this right for my use case, to what's this API signature? And so lots of projects really just want more people. Get them in at the top of the funnel. So Casbin said that you know daily visits to their projects almost doubled and bounce rates dropped. So more people came, more people stayed. And then uh, open API CLI docs, they had 95% increase in the number of users viewing their docs. A lot of projects use visits to their documentation as one of their core metrics. If the documentation doesn't exist, it's very hard to visit it and it's very hard to learn about the project. Um, sometimes you need to bring more kinds of people to your project to help them be successful. So um, I don't know how many of you do computational mass spectrometry as a hobby. I've been thinking about picking it up myself. But uh, OpenMS was able to get more newbies to their project um, based on the documentation. And uh, it also helped people that they have um, in the project that they give stipends for from underrepresented backgrounds. They were able to use that documentation to get a head start on their internship. So they were able to build a more diverse community based on this documentation. Um, more knowledgeable people. So uh, Moja Global had a handbook, common analysis tasks. Now people know better how to use the software. Um, <laughs> Curious Learning is an interesting project that helps people build eBooks. And then prior to the documentation, only those with technical abilities could build a book. Now, I may quibble about what technical abilities mean, but they were very happy with it. More knowledgeable people still, Calibri was able to do better translation of their documentation strengths, which I thought was a really great project. There you are. <laughs> That's Ian. He's right there. Raise your hand, Ian. <laughs> um, and then also more maintainers. They had a stewardship guideline in P5JS. And then it wasn't just about technical issues, but also helping people be good maintainers and reviewing issues and PRs and making a welcoming community. And of course, more contributors just in general. So Julia was able to uh, make documentation for more potential uh, contributors. And then Wasm Edge um, increased their contributors as well. Like, at least in order of magnitude. And then Docs actually get people fired up. Better docs make users feel like their needs are seen and cared for. That makes them more likely to be engaged in the project. Um, PyMC found that the, the new docs energized and mobilized their community. And docs have a spillover effect. When a project signals that they're working on things that aren't just the core, it makes people feel empowered to take on other non-code contributions, for example. Governance. Um, and again, enthusiasm is, I think, an, <laughs> it, it's the core resource of open source, right? Without enthusiasm, do we even have open source? And again, making your users feel like their needs are seen to, hey, we closed a bunch of issues. We fixed a bad bug with the docs website. We kept the site from freezing on search. I think that's a key goal. Sigstore was really happy with how their project turned out. And then creating more docs encourages more docs contributions. Um, many of the projects noticed that their technical writing community grew. Either their hired technical writers remained past the end of the program as active contributors, or the new docs energized new docs contributors. Either the docs were now easier to contribute to, or they saw some gaps still remaining in the project and thought, oh, I can fill that gap, right? More docs contributors in async API, and uh, they were able to recruit technical writers who were uh, who continued to be contributors to OpenMind. But uh, uh, the documentation working group that Mojo Global set up as part of their project is, is still ongoing as far as I know. But often docs can't help if people can't find them. And many, if not all of the season of docs case studies, either as a stated program goal 
or as an incidental goal as they went on, mentioned improving the organization and the information architecture of their documentation in some way. And so um, that leads to fewer confused people. If that you have easier to find docs, then you're gonna get fewer questions. Um, Modix found that their questions decreased by 20% and that um, Appia was able to link 95% of the chat room questions with a direct link to a wiki page, which is a time saver, even if it does give the people in the chat a little bit of an RTFM feeling. Um, <laughs> but now they can find the FM, which is great, you know? And uh, so many projects participating, for many of them, it was the first time that they'd had new contributors to their communities specifically for docs. And this caused new community problems. So maintainers found that they got a lot of value from working with technical writers. They learned new skills. They got valuable feedback about how it was, what it was like to onboard onto their project. And they got new perspectives on their projects too. However, many maintainers had never recruited a technical writer before. And that was a difficulty. You know, They weren't quite sure where to find them. Um, we do have a GitHub repo where technical writers who are interested in participating can leave links to their CVs and to examples of their work. Um, many people have recruited from the Write the Docs Slack. Um, but once you recruit the writer, then you have to onboard them. You have to figure out how to pay them. We, uh, projects pay through using Open Collective, and um, that was difficult for some projects who hadn't set up that apparatus before. Um, many maintainers have never written an employment contract before, so now we have a sample contract on our website that people can use. Um, payment hiccups, especially with people uh, in parts of the world where it can be difficult to receive payment. Um, communications coordination problems. A lot of people found great technical writers and didn't really think about the fact that they were maybe in an opposite time zone. And then, you know, async con uh, communication is doable, but you have to put the effort into it. And then, of course, uh, in 2021, many writers had to drop out because of illness, especially COVID family problems. Um, some technical writers started their projects when they were in between jobs and then got hired for a full-time job and didn't have as much time for the project anymore. And these are the kinds of problems that projects run into that we wanna see in their case study. Um, we've had some projects talk to us and say, well, you know, things weren't really smooth sailing, but we were really happy. And we're like, we don't want you to smooth over the bumpy parts. We want you to tell us about the bumpy parts because that will help people down the road. And it doesn't affect future participation in the program. If anything, it's the reverse. If we know that you're going to be, you know, very matter of fact and blunt about what problems you, you had in your project and reflect that in your case study, then we think that's a better document for people to learn from. And we're going to consider that a more successful project, even if you ran into problems. So, um, some of the things that the maintainers and the org admins said is that, guess what? You can't test docs text. And I have often said this myself, like there's no unit test for writing a novel, which is kind of one of the sucky parts of writing a novel. And then like the rest of the community, they got leveled up because of the standards of the technical writer. And then many maintainers and admins say, hey, technical writing is more work than I thought it was, which I think is a really great benefit of participating in this program. It's always great to see like what other people's skills are like if they're different from your own and get a window into that world. Um, so when you're thinking about participating in the program, these are some of the questions we think that admins and maintainers should ask themselves. Do you have enough people? And do the people that you have to work on this program, do they have enough experience? Like if, if your project hasn't really onboarded absolute newbies before, make sure that you know how you're gonna do that. Um, do you actually think that you can create documentation that will bring in new people, energize current people, or help people improve their skills? Like, think about are these docs gonna actually solve a problem that you have, or don't just make docs to make docs? And then can people actually find, use, and contribute to your documentation? So, we obviously intend for a season of docs case studies to be used by other projects as guides for how they can help solve their own problems through documentation. But I think it's important to understand how to use the case studies because you don't want to end up hitting your thumb because you picked the wrong hammer. Like not, not every one of these case studies is going to be applicable to every project. Um, I think before you start reading the case studies, you should know where your project actually is. What kind of problems do you actually have? Where are the pain points? 
Are you finding people drop off? Like they download your project or they fork it and then you never hear from them again? Um, do you have people who want to become contributors but they get blocked because they don't understand how to build or test your project? Um, do you have, are you part of a bigger ecosystem and it's very hard to integrate your project inside the bigger ecosystem? Um, do you need documentation to show how to cross that interface or that boundary? Because if you don't know where your project is, you don't know where to go and you won't know what problems you're trying to solve. Um, and so I think if you can't answer these specific questions, you might not be ready to think about what docs you need. So first of all, who's your user? It's probably not you if you're the admin or the maintainer of this project. So I want to spend some time on this you are not your user project uh, problem because sometimes I call this the framework problem, you know? So like, it turns out if you are the kind of person who writes your own framework, you're not the kind of person who uses other people's frameworks. So the answer to how do I do this, how the answer to that question for you is write a new framework. That is not the answer to the question for most people, right? So if you're building something for other people to use, the answer to their question of what do I use, you want it to be your project. You don't want it to be go write your own, but that's what you did. So you're not the user of the framework, right? Um, you may be the first user, but you're not having the same kinds of problems that other people have. Um, so, and then I think you can go back here. Again, not the only way to think about docs, but a great way to start. Um, so maybe it turns out that you've written a tool that helps newbies to do something, but you can do all of the horrible environment setup stuff in your sleep. But people who are really new, they cannot. So maybe they need a more comprehensive like installation, getting started how-to guide that is slightly more comprehensive than like NPM install, right? Or maybe your project makes something that's a tool that used to be in the domain of people who mostly had doctorates. But now you can no longer assume that everybody understands the basics of radio frequencies or linear algebra or, or you know, mass spectrometry. Um, and so now your project's getting a lot of like 101 level questions. And when your users were mostly PhDs, that wasn't a problem. But now when your users are people who are new to the field, you need some 101 documentation. So once you have a better idea of who your user is and what they're trying to do, it's easier to read through the case studies and understand how other projects that had similar problems implemented their own documentation solutions, what problems they ran into, and how they measured their programs and their projects impact. So um, one important question about metrics, when you're thinking about how to measure the effectiveness of your documentation, I think you really have to ask yourself this question. What behavior would this number make you change? So if you choose a metric, and you won't do anything different no matter what that number is, that is not a good metric. That is decoration, right? So if you chose increase in pull requests as your metric and instead your pull requests went to zero, would you do something different? What if it went to a thousand? If you're not gonna change your behavior based on a metric, it's not a good metric. And then, uh, so you can find all the project case studies, including links to the original proposals, except for one where they let their link die and now we put everything through the Wayback Machine. Um, so they're all on the Season of Docs site. Um, I also encourage you to join the community at Write the Docs if you haven't already. There's an open source channel um, where you can ask questions about open source documentation. Um, the timeline of the 2024 program, which is about to wrap up, is uh, on the site as well. And we also have some guides for admins and links to our GitHub repo, which has like a docs audit template and um, press lists of technical writers who are interested in participating in the program. And um, yeah, I am happy to answer any questions and talk about technical writing probably until like the sun explodes, but I think we <laughs> only have a few more minutes. <laughs> so yeah, any questions? I have a mic and everything. Ooh, and I have a mic runner in Sophia. No questions? I have so many, I have so many answers though. <laughs> Sophia has a question. Sophia is the audience plant as well as the mic runner. Um, I have a question about metrics. No, you just turned it off. I saw you. <laughs> Hello? No. How's it not working? Now it is. Now it is? Can okay. Interesting. Um, so for metrics collection, um, were there anything specific that uh, 
folks were like tools they were using or adding to any other documentation sites or tooling to collect metrics or are they doing this manually? Um, I don't want this to sound like a shill, but a lot of projects were just using Google Analytics because it was what they were comfortable with. Um, some projects were using other analytics tools. I think we saw a couple of projects using Plausible, which is a, a more privacy focused analytics tool. Um, uh, I think a lot of the metrics were also things that they could naturally collect out of GitHub, like number of pull requests, number of issues. Some were a little bit more manual to collect, like we're going to count the number of questions in our chat room. Um, some projects were going to do surveys of their users. Um, the more scientifically minded projects were the ones who were more likely to do surveys. Um, they also tended to have um, uh, at least some people who were at universities where they had like more support for doing these kinds of surveys. So, yeah, They were kind of all over the place, the metrics, but I think some of the main ones were page visits, questions, issues, new contributors, PRs, and um, uh, like CSAT, like customer satisfaction scores. Anna. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I have applied for the program twice actually, but never have been accepted by any project. <laughs> but um, it was like back in the times when it was like the system was uh, that you applied to the Google, like, the, Men the mentorship years, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that one. Um, I'm wondering that probably most of the project that apply for the, like they have docs in a form like some web docs, probably through docs as code pipeline, but have you, do you remember, I, I'm not assuming that you remember all the projects, but is there something that were more standing out? So for example, docs for desktop projects or for some physical devices, have they ever participated in the, uh, the season of docs and how, how it's different for them, this um, like results, um, not for like typical web based docs where, where they're m much more easier to measure the result, but something different. Um, we have had some projects that are for like physical devices. There was one, there are a couple robotics program projects that that applied. There was one where unfortunately they weren't able to work with the technical writer that they had selected because they were working on drones and they didn't realize that the technical writer's home country treated drones as a munition. And so they weren't able to send the technical writer the drone to, to like work with. Yeah, that was a, yeah. So know what your technical writer's home country considers to be a munition, I guess is new advice for maintainers. Um, but most of the docs that were produced were uh, web delivery docs, not printed docs or not embedded docs. Um, uh, we did have several, I would say one project a year or so, part of their project is transitioning from one docs platform to another. I don't think anyone in this room would be surprised to learn that um, it always takes longer and is harder than they think to transfer docs platforms. So. You know, take your estimate, double it, double it again. This is my advice for if you want to have a project that transitions stocks platforms. So I have a question. Obviously, as a participant, um, I've, I've kind of been through the process. But um, when you know, obviously, the the kind of main thing here is is, is connecting technical writers to a project and and so um what, what kind of feedback do you have on, on on that process you know when the uh, organization kind of starts to you know reach out for uh, for the technical writer I'm, I'm kind of interested about sort of how they go about uh, deciding and, and and kind of you know from the sort of list of applicants etc um how do they kind of make those decisions or and do you have any feedback on, on from on, about that? So, to speak of in extremely general terms, I would say that admins tend to over-index on, uh, I would say, basic code contribution skills. Like they will be like oh, I really want a technical writer who already knows how to make a pull request. Um, 
some of them are very focused on finding people who have domain knowledge. And I think in, for the more scientific projects, that is a huge advance. And they tend to under index on actual technical writing skills in terms of like information architecture, proficiency in the target language of the documentation. And so I would say that uh, sometimes I think that the failure mode is that admins want someone who is very much like them, but just a slightly better writer. And, <laughs> and so I think that's a human thing. Like people, we know this in terms of bias and hiring that people tend to look for people who are similar to themselves. And so knowing that that bias exists, I think people should try to uh, um, ward against it a little bit. I think that the more successful technical writers are the ones who have had technical writing experience across multiple domains. So then they show that they are able to like onboard quickly to a new domain who have experience in information architecture, so they've organized things before, and that they're, you know, reasonably proficient in the target language. I don't think that they have to be primary speakers of the target language. I don't think that's necessary at all, but they should be proficient. And um, I think that a lot of times, uh, more developer-focused open source contributors don't understand that the the economic advantage for technical writers in open source is not as great as the economic advantage for developers in open source. How many people here have gotten a job based on their open source contributions of code, right? Like lots of people at this conference are working directly in jobs that are related to open source. And for technical writers, they're not paid as much as developers. They tend not to code in their free time, right? Many technical writers do writing in their free time. They do novels and plays and poetry and music and theater, right? And so, the incentives to participate in open source are not as great for technical writers. So you really have to make it, uh, that's why we changed into a grant program. We're like these people need to get paid because they're not being paid in either their like own natural affinity for the work and they're not being paid in terms of future career advancement, which is how many open source contributors are paid. They either naturally would do this in their free time or it will lead to better career opportunities down the road. And that's not necessarily true for technical writers. So I think when you're hiring, you have to think, what's in it for them, right? It may not be gaining experience in mass spectronomy, <laughs> like mass spectroscopy, right? It might just be like, oh, this is a career building thing for me, but it's not going to be as big a delta as it would be for a developer. So yeah, but um, take a look at the our hiring hall on the GitHub. <laughs> um, lots of people have put their, their resumes and their portfolios up there. And I also think Write the Docs is a great place to hire. Um, but definitely, I would be biased towards technical writing experience more than can they do a pull request, because I have taught many people from zero to pull request in like an afternoon. Like I taught somebody whose entire prior experience was writing for bridal magazines how to use GitHub. Like it is not. <laughs> like, it is not a magical key. Um, so, yeah, I think we're all, do we have time for one more question? I kind of lost track of time. Well, the guy in the back of the room is gone. And nobody else has come in. So I'll just keep talking here until somebody else comes in. And unless you all want to get up and leave, it's fine by me, too. Um, I've got tons of stickers up here as well. Please come and take a semicolon appreciation society sticker. So. Uh, I would like to know if you have a successful case study for someone who used AI in their docs or docs creation, or if it's too early to tell, and those applicants right now are probably at least some somehow leveraging the power of AI. Um, I think we only had one proposal this year that mentioned specifically AI, but I am absolutely sure that multiple case studies are going to mention like, hey, we decided to try AI. Um, I think that it's, uh, I think that it's a very interesting technology. And I think that it's actually going to make the demand for technical writers higher because you can't learn from things that don't exist. So you can't use an AI to magically create actual documentation if there's no documentation in the world to learn from. Unless your project is so mundane and vanilla that it's exactly like many other projects out there that have very similar documentation. So a lot of people inside of Google have actually been talking about, we have to improve our documentation or the generative tools don't have anything to work off of. 
So I wish it were like a magic genie with a lamp that you could rub and you know <laughs> make perfect documentation come out of nowhere, but unfortunately it doesn't quite work that way. I'm very interested to see what people try. I've personally tried it for dictionary work and found it um, not working so great, which kind of makes me mad because all of language is just statistics and AI is just statistics and you would think it would work, but it didn't work. So sorry for the off topic rant. It's a good question. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much for your kind attention.